When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Whether you're making the same breakfast that you have every day or baking a cake for an extra special day, eggs are a staple in our diets. Eggland's best eggs are nutritionally superior to ordinary eggs, containing six times more vitamin D and double the omega-3s. Not only are they better for you, but Eggland's best eggs taste better too. There's a reason that they're America's number one eggs. Visit egglandsbest.com for additional information and delicious recipes. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that was all set to play the role of Pennywise until the director found out that he's not a clown, he's just a damn fool. He is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Today, we are drinking Kessler Trail Ale by the fine folks at Apple Blossom Brewing Company in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Garage grade three and three quarters out of five bottle caps. Kessler Trail Ale is a Belgian blonde ale named after Mount Kessler. Mm -hmm. This Belgian blonde single ale is crisp and refreshing. The imported Belgian Pilsner and American Pale Malt create a delightful fusion of crisp, light malt flavors. Kessler Trail Ale was brought to us by these delightful people. First up, big shout out and thank you to Craig in Wisconsin. And a big shout out to Kelly from Crown Point, Indiana. Next up, we have Carrie, Curtis, Courtney, and David, all from the beautiful town of Parts Unknown. We still have tents available. And we want to give a shout out to Keith in Colorado Springs, Colorado. We like your gym. Next up, we say thank you to Amy from Northern New Jersey. Also, That's a Jersey. Also in Jersey, we have Brooke in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Oh, some more as a Jersey. And last but not least, we say thanks to Ruben, whose parents named him after a sandwich down in Austin, <laughs> Texas. Ruben says, "Try some Lake Fire Rye Pale Ale from Grapevine." We hey, will try try the Ruben on rye, Ruben. <laughs> We will get right on that. Thank you all for pitching into this week's beer fund. And if you want to buy us around for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. If you haven't been to the website, you need to go to the website. I'm surprised that not everybody is on our mailing list. We have some new merchandise that we're working on, and this will be available first to the mailing list. Yes. Before anybody else, the mailing list will have an opportunity. So if you snooze, you lose. Yes, make sure you sign up on the mailing list. Also, while you're at the website, check out the store page. We have all of our old episodes available there for purchase. They're available for purchase at the iTunes store as well. And that's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Clinton had integrated a number of corrupt cops, judges, and politicians into high-level positions to ensure the continued success of the drug smuggling, money laundering operations. All was going well until a fateful night in the fall of 1987. On August 22nd, 1987, Kevin had spent the night with his friend Don Henry. They left uh, Don's home around 12.30 or quarter to one uh, on the 23rd of August in early morning hours and 
uh, the next thing we knew, they had been run over by a train. There seems to be a small airstrip in the area. There have been sightings and uh, reports of small airplanes flying very low with lights off in the area. I believe they saw something they shouldn't have seen. Three weeks later, their deaths were ruled accidental by the state medical examiner, Fami Malik, and um, we disagreed with that ruling uh, because we thought the evidence pointed to homicide. Uh, at that point, we had a lot of questions and no answers, uh, and the facts didn't add up to what he was telling us, so we decided to get a second opinion and uh, met with resistance from all fronts, both with our local law enforcement, with the state crime lab, uh, with everybody that we turned to. Uh, we obtained court orders uh, we, requesting samples of everything that the crime lab had for a second opinion. And uh, Femi Malik um, uh, resisted court orders. Uh, he refused to obey them. Ultimately, it was proven that Don Henry had been stabbed in the back and Kevin Ives' skull had been crushed prior to the placement of their bodies on the railroad tracks. However, Malik stood by his ruling that the boys had simply fallen asleep on the tracks. Malik had been kept in office at the insistence of Governor Clinton for a number of years, despite vigorous public outcry to have him removed. As long as Malik's rulings pleased the governor's office or state police, they were left to stand, no matter how implausible. Malik's obvious lack of medical knowledge reached a pinnacle when he ruled that James Milam, who had been decapitated, had died of natural causes. Yet Clinton, who had the power to remove Malik from office, insisted he stay. There were allegations of tampering with evidence in murder cases. Uh, there were allegations of perjury in different cases. It didn't seem to matter what Malik did, Clinton uh, protected him. He made excuses such as he's overworked, uh, he's just stressed out. He's underpaid. Uh, they gave him a $14,000 raise, which was an insult uh, to my family as well as a lot of others in the state who um, to this day are struggling with asinine rulings in the deaths of children and other loved ones. I was outraged that protecting a political crony of Clinton's was more important than the fact that two young boys had been murdered. Dan Harmon was just a local attorney in, in the town of Benton, Arkansas. And uh, after Don Henry and Kevin Ives were killed and their bodies placed on the tracks and run over by a train, he approached Linda Ives and the Henry family about trying to help them. He's a manipulator. Gives a great closing argument in court. He's been trained for years to play the game. He knows how to do it. He's very good at it. Mr. Harmon can win your confidence and make you think he's the greatest guy in the world. He did that to Linda Ives. He helped lead them down a path that absolutely led to nowhere on this case. I got involved in the case and immediately Harmon uh, tried to discredit me without even knowing me couldn't figure it out. I run across a young lady named Charlene Wilson who told a horror story that I didn't really believe at the time. So I started searching for evidence to substantiate just part of what she had said. Herman went ballistic. Uh, called, he threatened me, threatened Sheriff Pridgen, threatened Captain Gene Donham, the chief deputy. All because I talked to this one woman. The people at the track that night, to my knowledge, were Dan Harmon, Keith McCaskill, Larry Rochelle. On Sunday, August 23rd, 1987, two teenage boys were run over by a train traveling through Bryant, Arkansas. 
What followed was an investigation by local law enforcement. This is the Saline County Sheriff's Office who refused to investigate this as a possible homicide. They saw no evidence of foul play, but they weren't really looking for any. Uh, Publicly, the sheriff's office spoke of the incident as though it were an accident. And to the families of the two teenagers, 17-year-old Kevin Ives and 16-year-old Don Henry, they talked as if this were a likely suicide. The medical examiner, this is the captain's friend, Fami Malik, mm-hmm. ruled the deaths an accident due to marijuana intoxication. Well, he ruled these deaths an accident due to his stupidity. Months after the deaths, two men present themselves to the families of the boys. This is Richard Garrett, and he brings in Dan Harmon, who is appointed as a special prosecutor in this matter, working with the grand jury, trying to piece together a double murder case. And Garrett and Harmon will help out in this case. They do get it overturned from an accidental death to a possible murder. Yes, and then they start investigating, looking for the killer or killers of these two boys. Last week, we took you through the night the two boys were run over, the medical examiner's findings, and even though the sheriff's office and the medical examiner both decided this was an accident, we showed you a second autopsy, which showed significant evidence that both boys were dead before they were placed on the tracks and that both boys were murdered and placed there so that their bodies and all other evidence would be destroyed. And we can clearly see that Don was stabbed in the back. And we also can see that Kevin was, he had a skull fracture. Mm -hmm. Somebody, and we have eyewitnesses that saw uh, possibly a police officer hitting him with an object in the face. Mm -hmm. Probably the very rifle that the two boys were carrying that night. Very possible. Fluids in the body pointed toward a slower death for both and not a sudden death like that of a being run over by a train. Mm-hmm. And eyewitness statements regarding the lack of blood and the color of the blood proving that the blood itself was not fresh. We also talked about witness statements, many of these given to the Arkansas State Police. Two witnesses placed Dan Harmon at the tracks the night that the boys died. And this is why the case is so odd. Is because you have this guy, this prosecutor that comes forward and says, hey, you know, this lawyer that says, hey, I can help this family. Mm-hmm. I can bring some justice. Oh, it wasn't an accidental death. It was a murder, and we're going to find this person. But then the more you dig, you realize this person that's claiming they're going to help you, they're, they're the ones that people are saying it possibly is uh, – responsible for these murders. Yes, exactly. Now, we do have to introduce a man by the name of Barry Seal. Barry Seal was a gun runner and a drug runner in the 80s. Uh, Barry would arrange for privately owned planes to fly guns to Columbia, and on return flights, he was bringing drugs back into the United States. At least one pilot has come forward who claimed to have many times flown a drug drop at the place where the boys had died. Mm -hmm. Some of the local law enforcement was in charge of securing these drops. And just prior to Kevin and Don's deaths, a drop at that location had gone missing. So those local law enforcements that that were involved in this operation, well, they were on high alert. They were waiting for somebody to try to steal that next drop. Mm -hmm. And then that night, Kevin Ives and Don Henry happened by. Let's get to each one of the eyewitnesses and what happened with them after they came forward with information. Well, we should start off with the big one. And this is Charlene Wilson. She had the statement saying that the people at the tracks that night were Dan Harmon, Keith McCaskill, and Larry Rochelle. She also said that she believed that the boys were watching the drop site and that they got curious about what was being dropped there. Well, we know that Charlene Wilson, she ends up in prison. Yeah. And who puts her in prison? Uh, Our good friend, Dan Harmon. (laughs) Right, right. Well, we got to put her in prison so she stops running her mouth. Right. And the thing is, that the thing that's crazy about her confession mm-hmm. is that this was a confession that was, she gave this confession, written confession in her, in her own, in her own writing. Mm-hmm. And this is witnessed by three officials, three law, law enforcement officials. Mm-hmm. And we know that because their signatures are on her confession. Well, when I normally confess to something, I do it in somebody else's handwriting. (laughs) Well, she confesses in front of these three people Mm -hmm. in 1993. 
And then this confession goes nowhere. None of these law enforcement officials do anything with this confession. It's buried in the crime file. Right. And in the case file. And it's not discovered again until 2015. Right. Just to play a little devil's advocate here, though. Is it a coincidence, though, that she is put in jail by Dan Harmon? You know, put away to keep her quiet? Or is she coming out later saying, oh, he was involved in these murders, which maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. We also had several witnesses who placed two Pulaski County officers. This is Kirk Lane and Jay Campbell as not only being in the area where the boys were killed, but as having been seen. And I'll quote one of the witnesses statements as beating the shit out of the two boys near the grocery store down by the tracks. The first man was who we simply just know as Jerry who was described as a Mexican looking man in a dark blue Camaro. Right. Jerry, after telling Mike Crook that he had witnessed the two boys being beat up and thrown into the back of an unmarked police car, he went and told this story to Sheriff Jim Steed. Now pay attention because that's a name that's going to come up several times. Jim Steed was the boss hog at Saline County. He was the sheriff. He was running the sheriff's office. Jim Steed threw Jerry into jail and locked him up for 90 days for unpaid child support. The day that Jerry gets out of jail, he tells Jim Crook that he was told to leave town or else, Mm -hmm. and that he was moving to California. Jerry did leave town. We don't know exactly where he went, uh, but he's not been seen again. And Jim Crook's story was presented to the Arkansas State Police several months after the fact, and they made what I would argue to be no effort to identify this man that we only know as Jerry. Well, first of all, like I said, sketchy Jerry, you got to pay for your kids. You know, if you have child support, pay for your damn kids, right? Mm-hmm. That's one. Uh, two, who knows where he went off to. Uh, it's it's a little weird. Right? It's definitely weird. But uh, it's weird, too, that obviously they had reason to lock him up. Mm-hmm for the child support so they know his name Mm -hmm. and why they're you know maybe they're just not releasing to the public for his protection or maybe something foul play happened and they don't want that to be brought to life Mm -hmm. or does jim steed have a bigger role in this whole thing Mm -hmm. the other witness was ronnie godwin who stated that he had observed two police officers beat up two boys at the grocery store the night kevin and don were Mm -hmm. killed ronnie it was more like a Convenience store. Mm -hmm. Ronnie Godwin gave his statement to the police, and we should be very clear about this. He gave this statement to police during the time of the investigation. Now, Linda Ives, she's the mother of Kevin Ives, and Jean Duffy, who is a former Saline County prosecutor, Mm -hmm. and I want to put quotation marks up here. She's one of the good ones. Mm -hmm. Um, Jean Duffy interviewed Godwin 11 years after the murders. And Godwin's statements were identical to the statements that he had given to the police at the time of the investigation. Also included in the state police report were these interviews with Godwin's mother, sister, and girlfriend, in which they all reported to have said that when Ronnie drinks, he tells lies. But we need to keep in mind that when Godwin was interviewed by the state police in 1988, he had get, he had been in jail for a couple of weeks before giving the statement. So mm-hmm. he was he would have been sober at this time. Now, Linda and Jean also contacted Ronnie's mother to discuss her statements to the state police about Ronnie. She told them that she had never been interviewed by the state police. She also was certain that neither Godwin's sister or girlfriend had been interviewed by the state police either. So if this is true, then the state police had manufactured interviews of witnesses to discredit Ronnie Godwin. Well, yeah, I think it was this, I think it was this simple. Uh, We don't get, we don't have to kill this guy because he's a drunk. Yeah. He's got a bad reputation. We can smear his reputation. He's a drunk. He's a liar. This, this is not going to go anywhere. So we don't have to, Mm. we don't have to knock this guy off. But the thing we do have to remember, Captain, is that Ronnie told almost the same story as Jerry did. This lining up with Jerry's story corroborating both stories. Godwin via... Right, but but Jerry is one, he's shady, he's a dirtbag, doesn't pay for his kids, and he left town. Mm -hmm. So now he's already smeared. Now we got this guy with a drinking problem. Just because you have a drinking problem 
doesn't mean you're a liar. Mm -hmm. Now, Godwin stated that he did not tell anyone what he had witnessed that night until he reported it to police. Mm -hmm. Um, He also believes that the two officers that killed the boys that night, that they saw him as he passed by the store and probably recognized his car. Another state police interview states Richard Garrett, remember this is Dan Harmon's sidekick, rushed over to interview Godwin a second time. Right. It would seem that officials were taking Godwin's statement seriously. Uh, as it turns out, they were only serious about discrediting Godwin. Right. Following the interviews with Godwin, there was no attempt to identify the cops that Godwin had saw. No photos of local officers or unmarked cars were shown to him. No check of officers in the area that night who would fit the description. There was no check for traces of blood or other evidence in the back of any of the unmarked cars. Nothing. Just discrediting Godwin's statements by fabricating interviews with his mother, sister, and girlfriend, stating that when Ronnie drinks, Ronnie lies. Mm -hmm. The only true effort to identify Jerry was the state police stating that Jerry and Ronnie Godwin were one and the same. Right. So was Shady Jerry actually Godwin? Well... Godwin was shown the state police interview with Mike Crook, and he simply states that he and Crook knew each other. Mm -hmm. Crook at the time was married to Godwin's cousin. And so Godwin presented his story to police. So there's no reason for Crook to call Godwin Jerry uh, when he knew him. Furthermore, Godwin has never been jailed for back child support. In fact, Godwin has always had custody of his only child. Mm Mm-hmm. Crook also confirmed that Jerry and Ronnie Godwin were not the same person. They don't come out and say who Shady Jerry is. They just said, oh, well, he was in jail, and then he disappeared, and we don't know what happened to him. And now we got this other guy, Godwin, and Godwin is just a drunk. Right. So that takes care of two eyewitnesses. Mm -hmm. But see, here's where things start to get a little scary here, Captain. Both Jerry and Godwin, they describe three boys driving up to the grocery store on a motorcycle. Mm Mm-hmm. Don, two, Don Henry, two yes, Kevin Ives, and well, who's the third one? Well, we have we have they state the two boys get off of the motorcycle, mm-hmm. and around that same time, officers Campbell and Lane arrive. The boy on the motorcycle takes off. Now, this has to be Keith Coney, mm-hmm. a young man who told his mother he knew some stuff about the night the boys were murdered. Right, a young man who told his father he had seen Kevin and Don the night that they were killed, and he believed the two were killed by two police officers. Mm -hmm. All three of these stories align with one another. Three people that do not know each other, and the same story is told independently of each other. Now, Keith also had said that he was afraid for his life because he knew too much about Kevin's and Don's murders. Now, Coney was killed in 1988 in a motorcycle crash. This was nine months after Kevin and Don were murdered. The official report was that Coney had run his motorcycle into the back of a semi-truck, traveling at a high rate of speed. Now, Keith Coney was one of the last people to be seen with Kevin and Don alive. Keith had been called to testify. He was subpoenaed by Dan Harmon to testify in front of the grand jury. Mm -hmm. Now, there are many people that say that his death had not been a highway accident. That these witnesses had said that Keith was attempting to escape an attack, that he had jumped on his bike and tried to flee at a high rate of speed, and he was actually being chased by a vehicle when he swerved into the back of the truck. Witnesses saw Keith's body. They reported that his throat had been slashed, and he had several wounds that the witnesses did not believe would have been caused by a vehicle accident. Right, so another case where we have, and who was the medical examiner on that? Uh, Fami Malik. Right, so Fami again is going, ah, well, look, this is just just death by motorcycle. Well, I I don't even know how Fami talks. He he sounds stupid. Anyways, he probably said, look, this is just a simple death. It's a motorcycle accident, and that's all that happens. It's not a motorcycle accident if your throat is slashed. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you're escaping an attack, you're being chased by a vehicle at a high rate of speed. Right. That's called murder. mm -hmm. There was also reason to believe that Keith was selling drugs and was involved with some of the local dealers. 
Um, so he might have known some of these people at play here. Right, but I think this is part of the story that I don't really like, and we can get into this later when we talk about our own theories. Mm-hmm. But this whole thing about you know Don Henry and, and Kevin Eyes, they were, they were going out there, and they are going to steal these drugs right. from d- some drug lords. Right. And that, oh, by the way, the, the guy that ended up dead on the motorcycle, oh, he sold drugs too. Mm-hmm. I think it's an easy way to tarnish... You know, and not saying that these kids maybe didn't smoke pot, maybe drank a little bit, uh, maybe even sold it from time to time. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there were known drug dealers. And I'm not trying to tarnish Keith's name or Kevin or Don's names either. Better not. Um, I with with Keith, I just simply bring it up because because he may have known some of the stuff that was going on. If if in fact he was uh, selling drugs for somebody. He may have known these people that were out that night. It w- it wouldn't just be that, oh, it, it was two police officers. Oh, it was uh, this group of guys, and I don't know who they are. Uh, I'm just bringing up that he may have had some connection with these people. Well, no, and then the other thing about it is after the, C- Coney leaves on his motorcycle, he actually went to uh, the wagon wheel, yes. which was the bar, and he told— And that's when he told Keith McCaskill. Yeah, old McCaskill. So— you know, there is some validity because, you know, there is those rumors that McCaskill was selling drugs mm-hmm. or part of the drug running. So then why would Keith go talk to him? Right. If he didn't know, know him. Exactly. And if he did know him, he'd probably know him through. Yeah, but this is also a weird time because this is 1987, right? Okay. And, and w- when I graduated high school, 99, and you remember this because in our band would play. Yes, I was alive and around in '99. Well, we had the you know the metal band that we played in and would play gigs and we'd have parties and stuff to mm-hmm. kind of like promote the shows and stuff like that. And just kind of typical things. But we'd normally have mostly high school kids, but there yeah. would always be like a group of college age kids. Yeah, or even late twenty some. Yeah, and now of days like. You could not pay me to go hang out with high school kids. Yeah, I I wonder, I always, I didn't wonder back then, but once I got to be 28, 29, I wondered what those 28, 29 year olds were even doing hanging out. I think you got to be a pretty big loser is what I think is going on. (laughs) That You got to hang out with these young people. Which makes it a little more odd that Coney would go talk to McCaskill. So hold on to your seats because we're going to get into some super creepy stories right after this quick beer break. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Whether you're making the same breakfast that you have every day or baking a cake for an extra special day, eggs are a staple in our diets. Eggland's best eggs are nutritionally superior to ordinary eggs containing more vitamins and 25% less saturated fat. Not only are they better for you, but Eggland's best eggs taste better too. There's a reason that they're America's number one eggs. Visit egglandsbest.com for additional information and delicious recipes. Major phone carriers make you sign contracts with rigid data plans to trap you into a kind of forced phonogamy. Sounds pretty insecure if you ask me. At Consumer Cellular, we believe in a more consensual and healthy form of phonogamy, free of contracts and more flexible to your data needs. This way, you stick around not because we force you to with contracts and fees, but because you love our phone plans. Like ardently love our phone plans. Phonogamously. Consumer Cellular. When Freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. Freedom. 
Welcome back to True Crime Gay Reg. All right, Captain, we have to... <laughs> Cheers, mates. Cheers, mates. We have to introduce a man by the name of Gregory Collins. Mm-hmm. Now, it is believed that Collins had information on the Kevin Ives and Don Henry deaths. In January of 1989, mm-hmm. Gregory Collins died from three shotgun blasts fired at a close range. Now, one shot hit Collins in the face. His body was discovered in a pine forest in a county south of Saline. Collins had been called to testify to the grand jury, but he had never appeared. Now, newspaper reports that Garrett and Harmon questioned him privately about the train death case. Right. Question him or threaten him, I guess, depends on how you look at it. The strange thing here, though, Captain, is, you know, little is known about what he may have known about this case. Mm -hmm. He he may have known something because apparently he was interviewed or, like you said, possibly threatened by Garrett and Harmon in private. Um, But he he is shot three times with a shotgun. Now, we have a little more Fami Malik shenanigans Mm -hmm. going on here because this is one that Fami Malik would rule a suicide. So if you believe the medical examiner, wait, Mr. Wait, Malik. Wait. Okay, just say it slowly for me. Say say the stupidity slowly for me. Okay, so if you are to believe the medical examiner, Fami Malik, mm-hmm. then you would have to believe that Gregory Collins drove out to a remote place, yeah. went into the forest with a shotgun, and managed to shoot himself three times and one of those shots being to the face, where presumably that's the shot that killed him. Um, it's not impossible that somebody could shoot themselves three times, uh, but I find it highly unlikely with a shotgun. With a shotgun, it would be very, it would be extremely hard to do to shoot oneself three times oh, with a shotgun. You know, that's just Fami being Fami. You know, that's just Fami being Fami. Yeah, that's just Fami doing whatever the hell he wants. Uh, at, at, or, yeah, or what he's paid to do by others. You're exactly you right. Know, but, th- th- that's the other thing too. It's like I'm not saying that he's a dumbass. Mm-hmm. He might not actually be a dumbass. But when you have higher ups that are right, one writing your check, and you got people, you got eyewitnesses dying around you. What, what the hell are you going to do? Here's the other thing, though, Captain. Too, we talked about. Remember, Fami Malik got a nice. He got a handsome. Uh, promotion. Well, not a promotion, but he got a raise. Well, yeah, and I said I think forty three percent, but it was a forty one percent raise, which was announced to be what, like fourteen thousand mm-hmm. dollars? Was the actual the the money amount there was fourteen thousand? So yeah. if that's a forty, let's just say it's a forty percent raise. Mm-hmm. So that means he's making, and I'm going to show my dumb math here, but that would mean he's making in the ballpark of what forty to forty five thousand dollars a year before yeah, yeah. that raise, give or take. Yeah. So now he's making under sixty. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would think that people that are importing pounds of cocaine and moving them would have the means of buying Mister Malik off pretty cheap, mm-hmm. probably. If the guy's only making sixty grand a year. Uh, it probably doesn't take a whole boatload of money to get him to say, you know what? Not only do we need you to say that this was either an accident or a suicide, but you're the medical examiner. Nobody else is going to follow up on this. Whatever you rule, this is probably what it's going to sit as forever. Right, right. But they, but they did follow up on many cases. If you know, you know, what I mean, like people eventually started going, hey, there's something wrong, and that's what frustrates me about this whole case yeah is not only did uh, you know families came forward and said hey something's not right and the, the, the powers that be going all the way up to bill clinton which was this governor at the time he wasn't mm-hmm. president at the time but goes all the way up t- to that jack wagon mm-hmm. right and he comes back and says hey look it's none of my business i i think he's doing a pretty good job mm-hmm. yeah <sighs> he's doing a great job yes yeah, fuck Malley. you bill uh, okay. All right. Calm down there, Captain. Well, this is just, you know, it's ridiculous. I mean, three shots, sh- you know, three shotgun shots to the face. Well, and, one and to he, the face. Right. right Two one. to the chest. Right. Uh, but you're going to shoot yourself twice in the chest and then one in the face. Well, let's keep in mind, a shotgun's a pretty powerful shot, too. That'd be really hard to do anyways. Yes. I mean, the recoil alone would probably mess up your hand on some level or... 
I would argue that nobody would, that very few people would even have the strength remaining after one shot to fire an additional two shots. I mean, it's, this is just asinine, really. Next, we have Daniel Bearden, uh, who went by the name of Booney. Um, Booney was from Alexander, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Uh, About six weeks after they discover Gregory Collins' body in the forest, uh, police began searching another remote area Mm -hmm. for the body of this Booney guy. Um, And he he was another person that was asked to testify to the grand jury. It's probably suicide. Well, he he was actually missing for about eight months at the time that they started searching for him. So okay. they were in no hurry to go looking for him. Right. Um, police, they only went out there because they received information that he was buried near the Arkansas River. They went out there and they searched and they found nothing. Um, so this guy is is unaccounted for, suspected to have been killed and buried somewhere. Um, now, a person by the name of Woodrow May testified that he, Woodrow, was the middleman in a local drug trade. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he also stated that three other people had similar arrangements with the guy that he was getting his drugs from. And in this statement, he also says that two of these people, Harmon knew personally and may have had some kind of arrangement with them. The reason why I bring up Woodrow is because in that same statement, Woodrow stated that Booney was one of his distributors. So again, we're seeing the drug trade, the drug trafficking right, going right. on wrapped around this whole case. Right. And this also brings us to eyewitness James Millam. Yeah. We talked about Millam a little bit earlier, but we didn't identify him by name. Um, he had information regarding the Ives and Henry deaths as well. He was scheduled. He was, you know, they had a long list of people that they were going to talk to with the grand jury. He was on that list. Uh, He didn't get the opportunity to do so, though. Remember, he was the guy that was found decapitated, but Fahmy Malik had ruled that it was a um, it was natural causes that he had died from an (laughs) ulcer. ulcer. Yeah. 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 Which apparently that that you have an ulcer, your head pops off. That's that's according to Fahmy Malik. That's what happened. And um, and we here's the crazy thing. He's decapitated and. Fami Malik claims that the dog ate the head, right? Ate the head of the, of, of his owner. Mm-hmm. Now the thing here is his whole story got all screwed what, up. When what, do we know what kind of dog that is? Um, cause I'm not, it was probably a very small one. I'm, no. in, I'm in the market to buy a dog and I'm not buying that kind of dog. Okay. So that's what Fami Malik says. Cause when I die from an ulcer and your head I, pops off, I do not want my dog eating my head. Okay, but listen to this, Captain. Malik says that the dog ate the head, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, then there's a big problem with his finding because the police, shortly after Malik gives this ruling, they find the head. Right. They find the head, and then Malik's like, well, that's because the dog regurgitated it, that he threw up, he ate the head, and then he puked it, puked it up. Right, the more and more we cover this story, the more I just think... That he has paid or knows that if you don't cooperate, you're going to die of an ulcer and your head's going to pop off as well. Mm-hmm. I, I look. I don't think it's stupidity. I don't think. I don't think any doctor is that dumb. I think I really. The more we talk about it, the more I think that his hands were tied, and he knew if he didn't follow, you know, the powers that be, that he's going to end up worm food. I think you might be onto something there. You, he, he could have been afraid. He could have been being paid under the table by some of these people, or it could have been a combination of both, yeah, which right, is probably right, right. what is most likely. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing here is, though, you know, while we're on Fami Malik's story here, that he started off as an assistant to the medical examiner, yeah. and very quickly the medical examiner retired, and he basically assumed the role of medical examiner. Well, and I wonder how long that guy worked for and and was he was he supposed to retire or was he just somebody that was not going to work within their system and uh, he was made to retire that's you see what i'm saying that's a good question we we don't know that but mm-hmm. what we do know is that what was discovered after fami malik had been the medical examiner right. for like seven it was either seven to nine years somewhere in that ballpark mm-hmm. they realized because of some of these cases that malik actually did not 
have the qualifications to be a medical examiner. He only had the qualifications to be an assistant. So they realized this. He wasn't even qualified for that, probably. Right. And they realized this after he's been running the show for almost 10 years. Yeah, but it's not, you know, Bill Clinton can't do nothing about it. Well, listen to this whole story. They, they, the governor's office, here's their statement. Mm -hmm. They say that it's not their problem because they're supposed to be a medical examiner's commission. This is a group of people that review and decide who is qualified for this position and who is not. So when Fahmy Malik took over the position, they should have reviewed his qualifications, reviewed him as a candidate and either accepted him or turned him down for the role. The problem is when people started going back and in, in interviewing this medical examiner's commission that supposedly existed, well, the people that were supposed to be on the commission said, yeah, I was on that commission at one point, but we haven't met for like 10 or 12 years. We've right. not met about anything for 10 or 12 years. Mm-hmm. I didn't know I was supposed to still be on that commission. Well, then the governor's office then says, well, because this commission didn't do their job, there's nothing that we can do about it. We cannot remove. We we can't remove. We him. can't remove yeah. him now. And at some point after it was discovered he wasn't qualified, he did seek out whatever training or knowledge he needed, or you know, to to become qualified for the position eventually. Right. Well, because he just got one a a forty one percent raise, and then he's getting probably kickbacks. Mm-hmm. And look, and again, there's the fear element when your governor is helping other people run drugs then and 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 some boys stumble upon that 16 and 17 year old boy stumbles upon that and they are murdered and they put their bodies on tracks to be ran over by trains you might fall in line too mm-hmm. you know what i mean you might do what they tell you to do well when the officials of Arkansas were asked, why would you give Fami Malik a, a pay raise after when we have people in the community? Wait, hold on, because we're selling drugs, people. That's what <laughs> they should have said. Bill Clinton should have said, "Hey, we're selling drugs, and we need somebody to cover our ass," and that's why we gave him a pay raise. But the thing here is, we they had people, they had families, they had people in the community basically picketing and calling for Fami Malik's job saying, fire this dude. We don't trust this guy. We can't Mm -hmm. feel safe living here. If this is what's going to be happening. And basically the officials said that, you know, because they were asked, why the hell would you give this guy a pay raise when all these people are calling for his job? Right. And 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 they, they stated, go ahead. Well, and it's not just the Henry family and the Ives family no. that aren't getting answers. It's a lot it's of people. all these victims and it's then multiply it by all their family and friends. And those are the people paying your salary. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, do you think Bill Clinton gives a shit? Do you think anybody in power that's getting paid a bunch of money actually gives a shit? You know, if they're running drugs, if they're willing to kill a 16 and 17 year old person, do you think they actually give a shit? And for all the people that right now that are listening going, well, this is just a conspiracy. This ain't conspiracy. This is a fact. We're stating facts. Mm-hmm. This is not conspiracy. But, but the funny thing is here, these, these officials talk out of both sides of their mouths. No because, shit. Because yeah. what happens here is when, when he's first awarded the pay raise, they, mm-hmm. they, stay, they say that, you know what? Fami Malik is a victim in this whole circumstance and that he deserves to be, you know, treated with respect right. and and to show him such, we gave him a pay raise. Well, then when they come back and they ask them later, there's all these people in the community saying he should be fired. How can you give him a pay raise? Then they state, well, he's due to retire soon. So we applied that pay raise to him not for him personally, but as a position, we were upgrading the pay to that position so mm. that when he does retire, we could recruit a more, you know, suitable candidate for this position. Well, you know, how they always come- have answers, don't they? Well, you're right. Because when you're high on cocaine, you come up with a million answers well, all at once. Well, let's keep going with this list here, Captain, because okay. it just keeps growing and growing. Next on the list is Richard Winters, mm-hmm. uh, who was actually at one point he was he was considered to be a possible suspect in the deaths of Kevin Ives and Don Henry. Mm-hmm. Um, he had he had uh, he had offered to cooperate with the grand jury and with Garrett and Harmon at some point, um, but again 
before he could do so. Okay. He ends up being killed by a shotgun blast to the face. Hmm. Um, but this was during a robbery in July of 1989. Now, it's it's not been proven, um, but but it's it's widely believed that the robbery was was not so much a robbery that it was more of a setup right okay right, right. that, that like we're going to stage robbery we're going to have this ro- robbery situation and one guy's going to end up dead and it, and conveniently it's somebody that's offering to cooperate with the grand jury and and maybe divulge what he may know about the deaths of these two teenagers mhm I think it's pretty obvious by now that everybody that we bring up on this list is going to end up dead at some point. I told you this episode should be called murder. Yeah. Well, the thing here is one of the, one of the stranger ones to me is Keith McCaskill. Yeah. Now, shortly before Keith McCaskill was murdered, I have nightmares about this. Yeah. He, he told people that he believed he was going to be murdered. He, he was telling his family members goodbye. He was making funeral arrangements. He was telling his friends goodbye. Um, he was also telling his friends and family that like he was being followed, uh, by, by the two police officers that we had mentioned earlier that were Lane and Campbell that were supposed to be involved in the deaths of the two teenagers. He was also pointing out vehicles to his friends and family stating, you know what? I know that car has been following me for quite some time. Um, the thing here is that the, a big problem with this story is remember we talked about Sheriff Jim Steed. Well, there was an election coming up in 1988 and it was for the, the office of, of Sheriff. Now the thing is here that McCaskill on the night of the Sheriff's election in 1988, he was out with a bunch of people and he made a big announcement at this bar and he held up two pennies. He pulled two pennies out of his pocket threw them at the bar. Yeah. And he stated, he said, if Jim Steed loses this election, my life isn't worth two cents. And believe it or not, shortly after that, he was killed. Okay. So did he lose the election? Yeah. Jim Steed lost the election that night. And within 48 hours, uh, Keith McCaskill was murdered. But how he was murdered is what creeps me out. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so a quick description here, which I think is very fitting for Keith McCaskill, mm-hmm. uh, which is necessary, I mean. Uh, he managed a place called the we- the Wagon Wheel Lounge, mm-hmm. uh, and he was considered to be a big dude. He was six foot two. Uh, he weighed about uh, 200 pounds or so. Um, he was a bit of a legend for breaking up barroom fights. Several people told stories of him breaking up fights that involved weapons, sometimes even knives. And he would, without a weapon, go into this fight and break it up. Because he was a bad hombre. Yeah. And, but, but McCaskill might have been a bit of a weird dude, though, because he was, he was a known drug user. Mm-hmm. He was suspected of selling drugs. He had a lot of friends in low places, but he had a lot of police this, friends as well. <laughs> this guy is just all sorts of bad country songs. He works at the wagon wheel. He has friends in low places. Yeah, and, but but the the funny thing here, though, to me, Captain, is we talk about all these misdoings by these public officials and by uh, police officers and sheriffs, you know, deputies and things like that. Right. And, you know, to call somebody a weird dude saying that he's got a lot of friends that are in low places, but he also has a lot of friends that are police as well. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's that weird in this situation because it seems to me like some of the police were in pretty low places themselves. Right, right. That's exactly right. Now, Dan Harmon told Linda Ives and others that McCaskill was acting as an informant in the murder case, Mm -hmm. agreeing to pass along any information that he had heard in the nightclub. But more importantly, you know, according to Charlene Wilson's statement, McCaskill was at the tracks the night that the boys were killed. Right. And it is also believed that Keith Cooney went on to to find McCaskill and tell him what he had saw at the tracks or what he had saw near the grocery store that night. With the police officers beating up his friends. So on November 10th, 1988, this, like we said, this is just two days after the sheriff's election. This takes place around 1.30 a.m. A neighbor of Keith McCaskill's said that he had heard some loud groaning noises coming from McCaskill's home. Uh, this woke him up in the middle of the night. He, go, he goes to the window and he's looking around and he sees nothing. But what he says is that it sounded as if someone had drank way too much and was vomiting. Right. Uh, the following morning, a lady friend of McCaskill's came to his home and discovered his body. So what happened? How did he die? 
Well, McCaskill's body was wrapped in a flower pattern shower curtain, and he was lying in the carport area of his home. This is near a door that was going to his kitchen. Mm. He's covered in blood. Uh, his house inside the home completely covered in blood as well. Um, there had been an obvious fight and that lasted probably quite some time that had left blood everywhere. McCaskill had been stabbed over a hundred times. Jesus. Um, the stab that most likely killed him was there was one to the heart. Uh, all of the stab wounds were above the waist showing that McCaskill had defended himself and probably doing it quite well, uh, making the fight last a lot longer than maybe his attackers would have thought it would have. Uh, a lot of the slashes and stabs were to the arms and the hands showing that not only was he defending himself, but he was going after the knife that was stabbing him. Well, it sounds like he had an ulcer. Yeah, this is this is probably natural causes, or at the very least, an accidental death, right? <laughs> According to Fami Malik. Yeah. No, of course it was ruled a murder. Um, right. But but here's where it gets weird. Well, actually, not of course. In this case, that's it's true. Like not of course. Yeah, you're right. You you have to be like ex, you it's know happy. Yeah, you're like mm-hmm. oh finally. Um, well, th- now we we should talk about Ronald Shane Smith. Ronald Shane Smith was a neighbor of. McCaskill's right now what had happened was when the police after after the the friend the female friend found McCaskill's body she calls it in the police are there investigating whatever's going on and Ronald's father goes across the street and he says you know what I think you should talk to my son because I think he knows something about what has happened here right so they talk to the son uh now now Ronald Shane Smith is 19 years old at the time and he's he's considered slow at school. Yeah, he's uh, mentally handicapped. Not my words. These are other people's words. Um, the thing here is he tells them that he was over at McCaskill's place mm-hmm. and that he, he had gone there to purchase, I believe he purchased a silver tray and some pornographic uh, videotapes from McCaskill. The tray was going to be a gift for his mother. The tapes were something for himself right. and uh, he had owed McCaskill money. So he went over there to pay him some of the money that he owed him. And while they were there, he said that McCaskill was acting strange. He was looking out the window stating that people were following him and yeah, s- he's been calling this for weeks. Yeah. And he says, then at some point, three men, they, they pull up in a vehicle, they bust through the door. Yeah. But what were these guys wearing? There were th- there were three men wearing clown mask. Oh, no. Well, no. so no. what? Well, that's happened? what that's what they were wearing. But could you imagine? Well, we do have Stephen King's It coming out very soon. Yes, I, but what I'm saying is, if three dudes in clown mask showed up to my house, oh, that'd yeah. be. Yeah, you're hoping that it's one of your friends are acting nuts. I mean, I'd be scared, but at the same time, I'd be thinking I'm going to kick one of these dudes in the dick. Well. Uh, according to Ronald Shane Smith, two of the guys had knives and one of them had a gun and the, the guy with the gun, the clown with the gun comes up to Ronald and he forces him into a chair, holding him at gunpoint. Mm -hmm. A fight breaks out between McCaskill and the other two guys that are holding knives. At some point during the fight, the, the gunman takes Ronald outside And he says that during this time, he could hear McCaskill in the home being killed. Uh, You would think they would just shoot him. And then would it, you know, with the, when the struggle happened, you'd think that the guy with the gun would have just shot him and just took off. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Here's what really, that was my whole thing. I was like, why the hell wouldn't they just shoot this witness? Right. Mm -hmm. But then I also got to thinking about, well, if McCaskill was killed in a situation where it was a hit, where it was a planned murder, mm-hmm. well, why would why would you bother fighting with McCaskill anyway? Because if you just you, I wouldn't want to fight with McCaskill. It sounds like he could handle himself and and many others at the same time. Right, he was a ballroom brawler, man. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, they obviously wanted to keep this quiet. You can't just show up. You can't just show up to someone's home in a neighborhood and guns blast in everywhere and go unnoticed silencer the the thing here is you know so what they did according to ronald smith is that they gave him the knife and they told him that if he didn't stab 
uh, McCaskill, they were going to shoot him. And so he stabs McCaskill and they take a picture, a Polaroid picture of him at that time. And they tell him that they're going to keep this for evidence. If you ever come after us, if if we, if you tell on us, Mm -hmm. we're going to frame you for this murder. And again, his IQ was something around 80. So this is a lot of stuff and a lot of details that come up with out of nowhere. It, it is. Uh, the story doesn't end there. Uh, we'll, we'll get it back to that. But the I didn't really want to. I didn't really want to report on what his supposed IQ was because mm-hmm. I've seen some varying. You know, we we noticed this with West Memphis three and several other cases that we've covered that the IQ seems to be something that people argue. You know, people that would be for some kind of conspiracy, mm-hmm. th- they're going to lower his IQ when they tell the story. And people that think that Ronald Smith is guilty, they're going to raise that IQ. Right. The other thing that's been in question, I've seen different reports of ha- of the size of this 19-year-old boy. Mm-hmm. Because there's been a lot of people that said, well, you know, he was only 5'8", 148 pounds, there's no way that he could have taken down Keith McCaskill, who right. was six foot two over two hundred pounds, barroom brawler. Mm-hmm. Uh, but well, I don't bring a fist to a knife fight. But I've also seen reports that have uh, mm-hmm. Ronald Smith being as tall as five foot eleven and one hundred and eighty pounds, which is not a big discrepancy between the it, two it, men. Yeah, the, exactly, exactly. But his story does change uh, uh, upon further questioning. Um, the story changes to that. It was not three men in clown mask. It was five men that were dressed head to toe in black, Mm -hmm. uh, that they came in, but, but there's a lot of similarities. They came in, they busted through the door. They took over the situation. They controlled Ronald Smith and, and they attacked Keith McCaskill. Um, they did find, they, they found blood everywhere in that Mm -hmm. home. This fight lasted for quite some time. And he believed, Ronald Smith reported that he believed that the men that the attack took somewhere between 30 and 40 minutes to take place. The strange thing here, though, too, is Jim Steed. You remember the uh, the the outgoing sheriff mm-hmm. who lost the election? Well, he had hired McCaskill to take aerial photos of the of the tracks of, right. of the area where the boys were were killed. Um We don't know. I don't know if he ever successfully carried out those photographs. Now, he did have a briefcase in his home that had blood all over it, and it was opened, and and it wasn't full. You know, it wasn't stuffed to the brim with with items. Mm -hmm. So some people would believe that something was stolen from that briefcase. Um, It could have been aerial photos. It could have been... It could have been drugs. There was also rumors that McCaskill was making audio tapes of what he knew about the murders and what he and who he knew was involved. That way, if something did happen to him, that maybe police or maybe one of the actual good guys would find one of these cassette tapes. Yeah, if there was a good guy left. Yeah, it's it's getting hard to find any good people left. Now, the police, they did go and they found some of these, some items in Ron Smith's possession, um, out behind his home, they had found the silver tray that he had talked about purchasing Mm -hmm. some videotapes and they found some bloody clothes. Now in Ron Smith's story though, he says, remember he says that he was told to, to stab, uh, McCaskill as McCaskill was already dead. Uh, but he was also, he also said that he had fallen on the body at some point and got blood all over himself. Right. Um, it's difficult here, captain, because uh, you could make a strong argument either way in this case to me. But when I keep seeing name after name of people that are being called to the grand jury and they keep dying, yeah. um, it, it seems to me like McCaskill's murder is probably not a one-off committed by this Ron Smith. It's probably connected to this whole boys on the tracks situation. Um, now, Ron, Ronald Smith ends up being convicted of the murder of Keith McCaskill. Which my gut feeling says that is a, another tragic point of this story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and next we have Jeff Rhodes. Now, Jeff Rhodes was the young man from Benton, Arkansas, who was, he ended up being murdered in 1989. But shortly before his death, he made a phone call to his father in Texas stating that he needed to get out of Arkansas. And that he felt that he knew way too much about the boys on the railroad tracks 
and the death of Keith McCaskill. Uh, a couple weeks after this phone call, that's when Jeff is found dead. Uh, he had been shot in the head and he was, they had attempted, whoever killed him attempted to cut off his head and hands and feet. Um, they were unsuccessful with the hands and feet. Uh, and they had also set him on fire. Now they found his body in a uh, landfill. These are just savage people. Yeah. The thing is though, we have Jeff Rhodes. He's, he's missing for just a week. Right. But, Mm. but shortly after he's reported missing, Mm -hmm. his father reaches out to the sheriff's investigators and states that, you know, he called me a week ago asking if I could find him a job here in Texas because he needed to leave Arkansas. And this is why he needed to leave Arkansas. And he said there was never any follow-up even after they had found his body They didn't reach back out to him to further inquire what Jeff Rhodes could have been talking about. And somehow they link the death of Jeff Rhodes to this guy named Frank Pelcher. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's ultimately arrested and charged with murder. He's convicted and sentenced to life. Now we, we got to keep in mind here because of what took place in 1987, Dan Harmon, he's, he's a, quote unquote, special prosecutor. He's assigned this role. He's, well, he's, a, he's certainly not, special, right? But he's not technically, he's not an elected prosecutor. Uh, he's assigned this role in the, in the, the specific case of Don Henry and Kevin Ives. Now by 1990, he is the elected prosecutor. And so now he has all this additional power. So some of these cases that we're seeing coming about where the murder would take place in, in 1989, some of these people were probably convicted and, and wow. prosecuted by wow. Dan Harmon. Well, he had a lot of covering up to do. And that leads us to Jordan Kettleson. Now, Jordan Kettleson, he was believed to have had information regarding Kevin Ives and Don Henry's deaths. Um, he was also believed that he might have been a part of McCaskill's murder. Now, he was found shot to death in his front in the front seat of his pickup truck in June of 1990. Now there was no police investigation regarding his homicide. His body was cremated before an autopsy could be performed. Why? I have no clue. Well, because the autopsies were so bad anyways. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Hey, let's just not even get old Fami involved. It's probably an ulcer anyways. And, And I don't have definitive information about this, but it could be a situation where the police ruled it a suicide you know he's found shot in in his vehicle right um but again we've talked about this time and time again anytime you have a death that is as a result of unnatural causes you know an autopsy is supposed to be performed in this situation and it it wasn't the body was cremated before it could be performed well right not if you're trying to cover up and cover your ass you know Mm -hmm. we don't need autopsies so obviously this is so obvious right here captain we, we have an obvious, we have all these witnesses. We have all these people that are supposed to be called to the grand jury. People that have been reported to have had private meetings, private questioning situations with Richard Garrett and Dan Harmon. Mm-hmm. And we see person after person, you know, getting killed people, person after person dying in these mysterious deaths right. somewhere. We have people getting convicted somewhere. We have no explanation why they died at all. I mean, we had we had Jerry, who we don't know who he is. He mm-hmm. it, and if we believe that story, he moved out of the area because he was told to get the hell out of Dodge, right? Or he was killed and never found. And 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 the, one, they refused to identify him. It, right. You had stated earlier, and you're exactly right. It would have been so easy for Sheriff Jim Steed mm-hmm. to come forward and say, "Well, this is who Jerry was. I know who he is because we locked him up for 90 days." But nobody says that. And then we have Ronnie Goodwin. Now, Ronnie Godwin. I'm sorry. He's one of the lucky ones. He's still alive today, but but police refuse to believe his story more to the point where they say that he is Jerry when they know damn well he's not Jerry. Right. He's just a drunk. Can't believe him. We have Keith Cooney, who was probably, you know, witnessed too much stuff that night. He probably gave Kevin and Don a ride on the back of his motorcycle. Mm-hmm. He may have seen something go down at the tracks earlier. Yeah. And his death is ruled a motorcycle accident. We have Keith, right with a slit throat. Yeah, we have Keith McCaskill, 
who is murdered in his own home. He's stabbed over 100 times. We have the strange stories with the clown mask and the men dressed from head to toe in black. Right. And we, we have who could be another innocent person who is convicted of his murder. Right. We have Greg Collins, shotgun blast to the face, and it's ruled a suicide. Yeah. Three shots with a shotgun. He killed himself. We have Jeff Rhodes, shotgun blast to the face, his body is burned. He's found in the landfill. And we have this Pelcher guy that is arrested and convicted for his murder. And we, we got Rhodes telling people that not only did he know about the boy's deaths in advance before he's killed, he's telling them that he knows about McCaskill's death as well. Right. We have Richard Winters, who, who dies in the robbery. We have Jordan Kettleson uh, shot to death in, in the front seat of his pickup truck. And there's no explanation for how he died. We're not given a ruling on how he died. No autopsy performed. We have James Millam, who had an ulcer and his head popped off. It, it, you know, that's just Fami Malik straight out creating something here. Right. Just, just making something up. We have that Booney Bearden who vanished and we've never seen him. There, he's believed to be murdered. They've never located his body. What did he know? Yeah, and if this isn't... If this is enough evidence of a huge conspiracy to cover up these boys' death. I, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, they're covering up the deaths of these two boys, and then they're killing more people to cover up the deaths that they have to commit to cover up the, the original two. Right, and it all comes down to the fact that they have these drugs. They have to keep running the drugs. They want to keep having the money from the drugs, and that they're, they have higher-ups, I think, that are involved and this drug smuggling and this drug running, and it's it's the, the crime of greed, to, you know, the murder for greed just makes absolutely no sense to me. Well, and I know we probably got some loyal garage army people out there going, this this is huge, Nick and Captain. Why haven't we heard of this before? Well, mm. contact somebody that lives in Arkansas because these people have been talking about this case for thirty years. Right. Uh, this is no secret to the people that live in Arkansas and live in this area. And if alarm bells aren't going off in your head, ask yourself this. Okay, we've we've mentioned over what we've mentioned ten or a dozen murders here. Right. And there's probably a few that we don't know about because we're not in Arkansas and it's hard to find information about people that died in 87, 88, 89 from that time period. But ask yourself this, why do we have an, an area a remote area of a state where only about 5,000 people are reported to have been living there in the late eighties. And we got all of these mysterious deaths going on in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. It, it, there's something going on. In Arkansas. Well, and how many people are going to talk about this if, you know, clowns are showing up to people's houses and stabbing them a hundred times? Mm -hmm. If a clown shows up to my house, one, I'm kicking it in the, I'm kicking it in the goddamn dick. Okay. First of all, second of all, I hope that we put out a show next week <laughs> because if somebody finds me somewhere and my head popped off, it wasn't a goddamn ulcer. Your okay? stomach's fine. I, I mean, I will vouch for you. Your, your stomach is fine. You're solid I'm so in that area. <laughs> we, got, we we have a lot to uh, cover in the next case. And I think I, it's a shame that this case hasn't been talked about. And I see this all the time when, when and the, the thing that drives me absolutely insane is the word conspiracy when there are truths there. Mm -hmm. And when they start talking about these child sex trafficking rings, that maybe some people in the government are involved in. And there's some actually there's some validity to the story and it just kind of goes nowhere. To me, that is powerful people and rich people being able to protect themselves in a way that the normal person or the normal citizen of the United States of America cannot do. Yeah. And I think um, how much was like Bill Clinton involved in this? I don't know. But. He knew certain things about it. And again, I don't want to become political because I'm neither left or right. I'm normally always wrong. So you're usually wrong. <laughs> but well, my point is, is I, I don't like rich pricks and I don't like rich pricks using people for, you know, gains. And I don't like, I don't like people of power 
get in the way with horse shit. Well, we will try tomorrow to sum this up, put a nice bow on it, and open your eyes to some other goings on uh, that was taking place in, in Arkansas as well. All right, let's wrap this up because I got to do a couple sets down at the wagon wheel. Yeah, we will see everybody back in the garage tomorrow. If you if you don't hear from us tomorrow, notify the National Guard. All right, but until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. You can live out your master chef dreams when you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside, repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that.